there's a lot of melee weapons in Remnant 2. Just like in the first game, most of the non-boss melee weapons simply are not worth using. Here's a little scenario for you. Which of these two weapons would you rather use? This scrappy, repurposed lawnmower blade looks pretty cool. Looks like it could do some damage, maybe. Or this literal flaming sword. Most people are going to pick the latter option. And on most weapons, the stat difference in terms of damage or critical hit chance isn't enough of a justification to use the base non-boss variations. Hell, in some cases, the boss weapons straight up just have more critical hit chance, usually at the cost of a lower base damage. Outside of fashion, why would you run the Royal Broadsword over something like Stonebreaker? Yeah, one does cost more stamina to swing, but it's not a worthwhile trade-off. Plus, there's plenty of ways to just use less stamina. That being said, I'm still gonna cover every category of melee weapons. I'm not doing a build for literally all 36 base game melee weapons. That's not happening. This would be like a two-hour video, and I would be going absolutely insane making essentially the same build for like three plus weapons in some categories. Starting off, let's talk about the swords. With the largest selection of seven, this is what I'm talking about with just melee bloat, let's call it. The non-boss swords consist of Blade of Gull, Ornate Blade, and Scrap Sword. In defense of the first two, Blade of Gull and Ornate Blade both look really, really cool. Ornate Blade even has a noticeably longer melee range, which is a nice touch. I like that a lot. It still doesn't make up for the fact that it's basically just almost the same as the other two swords in this category, but, you know, small differences like that are appreciated. Blade of Gull, on the other hand, while I did mention it looks really appealing, I'm kinda disappointed it didn't get its own moveset. Like, it looks like a dagger. In the icon, it's pretty small, much smaller than the other swords, yet it just has the basic sword moveset. All that really needs to be done here is just make it swing faster, like a lot faster. Also, probably shorten the range. I tested it a little bit and it feels almost the exact same range as the steel sword. Or maybe just up the motion values. Moving on to the boss swords, we have Assassin's Dagger. This tiny sword deals extra damage against bleeding targets, applies bleeding, and deals additional damage when attacking from behind. You see what I'm talking about here? Why would you use Blade of Gull when Assassin's Dagger exists? Yeah, there's like a negative crit chance, but like, look at the mod. A built-in bleed dot is really nice. Goes well with a lot of trinkets. It's not always easy to get behind enemies, but if you run setups like Invader or Summoner, you'll have more opportunities to do so. For a build, I use Juggernaut from Challenger and Miasma from Ritualist, respectively. Then for Trinkets, I ran Ravager's Mark, Brawler's Pride, Blood Tinged Ring, Red Ring of Death, and Timekeeper's Jewel. For my Mutator, I ran Vampire Blade. It's a match made in heaven. For most of these builds, I'm just going to be running the melee crits, crit damage, and either swing speed, stamina cost, elemental damage, one of those options. Probably should have swapped out for, you know, something that has some sort of aggro draw, but I still had some fun with this build. The lowish base damage of the weapon does kind of lead it to feel a little underwhelming. I mean, if you do the math, the bonus 50% damage you would get from both a bleeding target and being behind is not really that much higher than even Blade of Gull. Kind of a case to argue for using it, but I don't know, It's one is just like the cooler option. A random ass dagger you get from a altar, or the dagger that was used to potentially kill a monarch. Not particularly an amazing weapon, but in co-op or in a build where you can have some sort of distraction, it's pretty fun. It just occurred to me, this is the part where I would typically say, oh, you know, this weapon is apocalypse ready or whatever. Melee weapons are so just not on the same complexity level as like guns that I don't know if I really should say. I mean, obviously there are the stronger weapons like Stonebreaker or Spectral Blade, but those kind of eclipse so many of the other melee weapons that it wouldn't be really fair to be like, oh yes, this is apocalypse ready. I'm just going to say if they're fun, good, maybe really powerful or just not worth using. I don't actually mind if anyone uses Blade of Gull because hell, it does look really cool. If you want to use any weapon, be my guest. I use a really weird combination of the Drifter slash Survivor set and the Leto's helmet. I look insane. Up next is Godsplitter and oh my god, is this weapon trying really hard. 
It looks really, really cool. It fits amazingly with Feyrin slash Feyrin's design, but it just isn't worth it. Look at that base damage. It's less than Assassin's Dagger. I really like the concept too. It's like a melee version of Deceit. But the low base damage plus only 50% weak spot damage? What? This means even if you build for some sort of weak spot boosting setup, the damage is just way, way too low. Also, only two seconds for the debuff? Ugh. It seems like because all the weapons are trying to be semi-balanced around each other, in this case the swords, the base damage here was way, way reduced to compensate because, oh, it can potentially deal plus 50% more damage at all times. But guess what? 114 times 1 1.5 is the exact same damage as Blade of Gull. I mean, at this point, I guess, yeah, maybe you should use the non-boss variations. Like, just think about when would you actually want to use this sort of weapon, ideally. The thought that comes to mind is Kayula Shadow. Most other bosses have a weak spot you can hit with, like, you know, your guns, or even in some cases your melee weapon. The only other spot I can kind of see this being a little useful is against, like, elites or other types of enemies that maybe, you know, are kind of hard to hit with your melee weapon if you were doing a purely melee-focused, like, run or something. But, like, there's just better options out there. <laughs> this is the setup I used. I'm not even going to go fully into detail about it, simply because it doesn't really matter. Anything that boosts weak spots is fine. The Fragment, Xania's Malice, Hunter, funnily enough. And, yeah, that's it. I am not even going to entertain the idea that this is really at all worth using on Apocalypse. It's really cool. It's close to being worth it. All you got to do is just bump up the numbers a little bit. Alright, I just uh, took a bit to think more and reread the description. Not sure how I didn't realize this before, but this does actually apply the same debuff that Deceit's mod does, which means that if you shoot enemies that have the Tainted Blood debuff on them, you will actually deal weak spot damage with Deceit. That does make it actually a lot better if you combo it with Deceit. It still is only 2 seconds, but on its own, it's still really bad. I guess if you are running Deceit, I guess totally pick this up, but uh, yeah. I don't even know if I would want to increase the duration now because of this synergy. I think the solution here is just to make the numbers on the weapon better. Up the weak spot damage bonus, up the base damage, and give it an actual crit chance, and this could be a pretty fun weapon to use. Moving on, thankfully, we have Hero Sword. Returning from the first game, it's pretty much identical to its original version. Although in this game, unlike the first, charge attacks for melee weapons all cost stamina. And just like in the original, the actual charge attack swing of the Hero Sword doesn't really deal any damage. And this is something that was changed in the Hell mod from the first game. Because it kind of is a little weird. I get that the main damage is supposed to be from the projectile, but it feels kind of bad when you swing really close to someone, you whiff the projectile, and then the sword does pitiful amounts of damage. Two more of the ranged melees, which we'll get to later, don't really have this problem, because their entire throwing mechanic is just, you throw it and that's the whole stamina cost. To make matters worse, the projectile can just hit a wall or something. This makes using it in close quarters combat or near corners or edges of walls an actual risk. Because like I said earlier, that swing isn't going to do any damage during a charge attack. All that being said, it is still pretty reliable. That beam of energy can come in clutch when you need it. One of the major downsides about it is just that the stamina cost from both the swing and the beam can be a little taxing. Using this setup here, Juggernaut from Challenger and Healing Shield from Medic, as well as the Trinkets, Energy Diverter, Rerouting Cable, Generating Band, Drakestone Pearl, and Archer's Crest, we'll not only be rewarded for spending stamina, we'll also be able to regenerate it while swinging the weapon. For the Mutator, I chose Reinvigorate. Obviously, this isn't a, you know, powerful build for the weapon, but I still had a little bit of fun with it. For mobbing, it's a blast. You can just run around, swing your sword, get a bunch of shield, and if anything hits you, it's just chip damage and you can pretty much shrug it off. Out of all the ranged melee weapons in the game, this one is probably the worst, but you know, it's still not bad. The other options just have a lot more going for them. Moving on to the last sword is Smolder. It's exactly the same from the first game. You do a charge attack, you apply fire dots. It's a pretty decent dot too. Compared to the original, 
it deals more damage in a faster time period. Its base damage may kinda still be on the lower side, but that fire dot more than makes up for it. It's pretty simple, like most melee weapons. Let's get to the build. For the archetypes and skills, uh, you've seen these two before. For trinkets, I've got Talisman of the Sun, Singed Ring, Alumni's Ring, Red Ring of Death, and Timekeeper's Jewel. For most of the elemental melees, Stormbringer is a pretty solid pick. As expected, this does a lot of dot damage. Red Ring of Death is just such a good, good ring for these sort of setups. While the actual swings from the weapon itself won't deal too, too much damage, for this kind of weapon, it's not your main attraction. When your dots are dealing like 170 damage per tick, most basic enemies and elites are gonna drop pretty quickly. On boss fights, your mileage may vary, depending on the type of boss you're fighting. Definitely want to make sure you manage your stamina. In this kind of setup, I didn't bring any sort of stamina management besides, like, Juggernaut. The good thing about running both Timekeeper's Jewel and Ritualist is that your dots last a very long time. You could maybe even run some firearms in your setup, unlike me in these clips. Smolder's a pretty safe melee pick, one that I would say is worthy of using on Apocalypse. Next up is Hammers, and there's only three of them. Base game, I mean. The DLC weapons, I will cover them in their own mini-video with the rest of the weapons from the first DLC. The Hammers feature a pretty small range of heavy-hitting slow attacks, the star of the show being that charged neutral attack. 280 motion value, very nice. Scrap Hammer, it's exactly the same as it was from the first game. I've got nothing more to say about it. It looks kinda cool, and that's the best compliment I can give it. Although, compared to the other two weapons, it may actually be an actual better pick over the other two. In some cases. Allow me to elaborate. Gas Giant and Atom Smasher both deal less damage and have a smaller crit chance than Scrap Hammer. So what benefits do these other two give? In the case of Gas Giant, its built-in mod can apply corrosive dots on hit and deploy a giant gas cloud on neutral charge attack, after dealing some damage of course. Once the weapon is charged, the damage will be converted from normal to corrosive, and like I just mentioned, you'll apply a corrosive dot on swing. This dot does increase the damage they receive by an additive 10%. Technically, this does mean that the swings, when charged, will be dealing more damage because of the dot being on the enemy, when compared to the scrap hammer. And if you never plan on using the neutral charge attack aspect of the weapon, then sure, you could totally run this over that one. But what if you do want to use it? Well, currently there's some weird jank going on between the dot from the swings and the dot from the cloud. The dot from the cloud deals more damage than the dot from the swing. And you might be thinking, well wait, they're two separate dot sources, why don't they stack? And that's a very good question. It really kind of sucks because you would think the stronger dot would be able to override the weaker dot. But no, if you swung at an enemy or hit them with that swing from that charge attack, that dot's going to be lower than if you had just graze them with the cloud and not the swing. It's just a bit of a nuisance, and if they had just made both dots stack with each other, which it really wouldn't hurt if they did, the weapon would be a lot better. And that's not even including the self-corrosion aspect of the weapon, which in some cases you might actually want. However, unless you plan on running Ring of Shahala or one of the other self-debuff items, you might end up just taking 10% more damage for 30 plus seconds. And yeah, you can pop antidotes, but the persistent cloud is still going to corrode you if you walk back into it. There's no build-up, it's just an instant corrosive dot. But for the sake of doing it, here's a build. For skills, it's the typical Juggernaut, and in this case, I chose Deathwish from Ritualist. Now that Kinship is working with Deathwish again, it's a really good pick. Effluvium Enhancer, Brawler's Pride, Acid Stone, Red Ring of Death, and Timekeeper's Jewel. For the Mutator, and this goes for any other melee in this list that has a damage charge-up mechanic, Latency is just really, really good, as it reduces the amount of damage you have to deal to charge them up, and it improves their efficiency, which in this case increases the cloud size and dot duration. I don't show it off in this build, but the cloud size is actually affected by amplitude. Visually, it doesn't really show it that much, but if you do test walking back and forth into like its radius, you can see it apply the corrosive dot. 
overall, it's not a bad pick compared to the hammer, and in the right setup, it can actually just be a side grade, if not an even match with it. Although because of the aforementioned non-stacking of the dots, you may or may not want to even attempt to use the neutral charge attack aspect of the weapon. This isn't even mentioning if you're running a different source of corrosion. You could be running Nebula or Tainted Blade, Corrosive Rounds, or Miasma. There's a lot of sources of corrosion in the game, and it's up to you if you really think that just this is a better solution. Because those sources will stack with it, but this weapon is just a little, a little jank. It's not bad, it just needs a small tweak. In the case of the Atom Smasher, I want to really love this hammer. I love the concept, it's a rocket hammer, which makes me really sad that the minuscule 10% attack speed boost just doesn't feel super impactful. 10% is just way, way too small to justify the huge dip in not only damage, but crit chance as well. What do you even build around this? It's just a hammer that has a very slight attack speed buff. Like, whatever you were doing for the scrap hammer, you can just do here as well. Although in this case, you probably want to get a little bit more damage, which you wouldn't have to do if you were just using the scrap hammer. And that's it. I have nothing more to say about it, no more input. There's no special text, there's no anything. It's just a weaker hammer that swings almost unnoticeably faster. The solution here is just to make the attack speed buff way more. Make it like 25-30%, something that justifies it being a rocket-powered hammer. Moving on, we have the Greatswords. The Greatsword moveset consists of long, slow, wide-reaching swings. For basic non-boss ones, there's the Iron Greatsword and the Royal Broadsword. They're both pretty much the same. One just looks slightly cooler. I'll let you be the judge on that. The Atom Splitter is pretty much the Moonlight Greatsword from Dark Souls. It's a ranged melee, just like the Hero Sword, in the sense that there's no aiming mechanic when firing them. Although in this case, Atom Splitter actually has an edge over Hero Sword. For starters, you don't actually have to do a charge attack to fire the projectile, but if you choose to, it increases its range by 3 times and damage by 25%. Visually, it's hard to see the 3 times more range. It does reach out that far, but the projectile I think kinda dissipates to the point where it's not really visible, if at all, but trust that it does actually reach pretty far. I'm also not super certain if Archer's Crest affects its speed. I tried a couple times in the testing range and on some enemies in Nerud. It might affect it, but if it does, the projectile is already kind of fast enough where it may not make a difference. Arguably, the best attribute of the projectile is that it completely bypasses terrain and passes through enemies. This quality is also shared by World's Edge, as we'll get to later. The biggest downside of the weapon is the fact that you have to perform a neutral dodge to fire the projectile at all. So even though you don't have to technically do a charged attack to fire it off, there's still that stamina cost in the form of doing the neutral dodge. Thankfully, the damage more than makes up for it, being way more than that of the Hero Sword. This is the setup that I ran. Frenzy Desk from Alchemist, and Attack Dog from Handler. For my trinkets, I chose Butcher's Fetish, Brawler's Pride, Bisected Ring, Akari Warband, and Probability Cord. Bisected Ring is something I want to quickly bring up here. It might be getting changed soon, I'm not too sure. As it currently stands, I personally think it's a bit too strong. I mentioned back in my October patch video that the balance change made to it, I think, was too much. 15% DR penalty for unlimited stamina nullifies so many different sources of stamina reduction whatever in this game. I try not to use it in every build in this video, because putting it on just makes you go caveman mode. You don't have to think about stamina at all. It's just, oh, I don't have to worry about this entire mechanic now. It's a bit too good, and while I do use it a couple more times in this video, primarily for anything that uses, like, a projectile or has some sort of throwing stamina cost, outside of that, I don't really like running it for melee builds. If you use it, that's totally fine. I do think that it needs a bit of a tweak, maybe bring back its 25% DR penalty, but make it a burden ring, or maybe just make it a big stamina cost reduction instead of it just being infinite. Getting back on track, my mutator of choice was Edgelord. It's just a really, really solid pick on a majority of melee weapons, especially, you know, since charge attacks are your most powerful form of damage on said weapons. Having them charge 35% faster and just getting 15% basic melee attack speed on top of that, and then you get lifesteal as well from charge attacks, it's so good. 
so if I end up not mentioning what mutator I was running, just assume it's Edgelord. It's a very comfortable pick. Out of all of the greatswords, this might be my favorite one. As I was recording, I ended up fighting Shahala, and I didn't know this before, but the projectile actually pierces through their hands and hits, like, I'm assuming the back, like either their head or whatever, and it hits twice, which is awesome. I love that. The range on this pretty much means that no matter how far away the enemies are that you're fighting, as long as you can predict their movement a little bit, or, you know, if they're stationary, you're never gonna miss them. While this doesn't have the width that World's Edge does, the height of the projectile actually lets you hit both ground enemies and sky ones at the same time. It's a really fun weapon, absolutely worth using on Apocalypse. Next up is World's Edge. Like most returning weapons from Remnant 1, it functions pretty much the same. You do a charge attack and it fires a big beam out, this one being sideways. This makes it excel when dealing with groups of adds. One thing I didn't mention for Atom Smasher that also applies here to World's Edge is that, much like the Hero Sword, the actual charged swing from the physical weapon itself doesn't deal a whole ton of damage. Just keep that in mind when you're swinging either of these swords around. One really good thing about World's Edge is that it does a whopping 80% more stagger damage. You can expect most basic mobs to easily be stumbled by these swing plus projectile hits. The best way of using this sword is not really for one-on-one -on -one boss fights, it's more so a mobbing tool, or one for dealing with a bunch of adds in a boss fight. Damage-wise, the beam is higher than the Hero Sword but lower than that of the Atom Splitter, and I think that's fine. It serves its purpose as being the ultimate mobbing melee. Distance-wise, it's not actually that short either. Like, yeah, you're not gonna snipe guys across Narud's planes with it, but in most encounters, you're gonna hit whatever you're looking at. I ran the same build as the Atom Splitter here. It's pretty much interchangeable for either of these swords. Both of these beam swords are pretty worth using on Apocalypse, I'd say. Last up for the great swords is Stonebreaker. This is pretty much the best one-on-one -on -one great sword. Unlike the other two boss variants, this one actually does full damage on its charge swings. Combined with Fault Line, the weapon's mods, damage, you have a recipe for a really powerful mailing setup. Both the swing and fault line projectile, or ground shockwave or whatever, can crit at the same time. And when they do, oh man is that some good damage. No, I'm not sure if this is still around, I did notice it happening a couple months back with the first DLC's release. Fault line can sometimes hit enemies multiple times, which is a bit nutty. I don't have any footage on hand at the moment, but for an example, I was fighting the boss spear guy from the DLC. I noticed that the little ground beam shockwave was hitting like four or five times, and that absolutely melted his health bar. It was in co-op, and it wasn't on Apocalypse, it was on Nightmare, but it was still pretty mind-blowing watching it happen. It might be a latency thing that was causing it to hit multiple times, I'm not entirely sure. I couldn't find a way of replicating it in solo play, so maybe it's been patched by now. Even so, it's still a really powerful sword. It does have a hefty stamina cost, but it's entirely worth it. Simply for the fact that the swing itself does full damage and isn't being reduced like World's Edge or Atom Splitter. Pop a confidence booster, use stone skin, anything that reduces your stagger makes this thing an absolute beast in one-on-one -on -one fights. A little bit of fly leech and you'll pretty much never have to stop swinging. You know, unless you do have to worry about stamina costs. There is a little bit of weirdness sometimes with the shockwave. It doesn't happen super often, but sometimes weird ground geometry can kind of eat the shockwave. Like I said, it's pretty rare. I didn't see it happening too, too much, but there is the chance that the ground can kind of just absorb your shockwave sometimes. If you're a point blank though, it's not going to happen. Many say it's one of the best melees in the game, and just watch any other like boss speed kill video with it, and you'll see why. Next up are the axes, and just like the hammers, there's only three of them. Although here it's two basic versions and one boss variation. The axe moveset is pretty much just chop, chop, and more chop. Motion value-wise, it's pretty low. The standard charge attack is just a two-part combo, and both of them hit twice for 140 each, which is not a lot. The best you're gonna get is the charged neutral attack, which is 165 twice. And both of those aren't even on the best axe in the game in my opinion. The two basic ones are Scrap Hatchet and Bone Chopper. They're almost entirely the same, although Bone Chopper does slightly beat out Scrap Hatchet in both damage and critical hit chance. It does have less stagger modifier, but it's like a difference of 4 points, and most of the stagger modifiers in the game don't really do a whole lot. 
only if there's something like World's Edge or Wrathbringer where they have 80% stagger modifier do they actually really do something. The Krell Axe is just the better pick out of the three. As I mentioned before, it, plus one other weapon we'll get to shortly, has the best throw out of all of the ranged melees. All you have to do is hold down the fire button, and you can aim where you want to throw it. No strings attached. That's the entire stamina cost, too. And while it doesn't pass through solid matter like the greatswords, it has a pretty precise hitbox, meaning you don't have to worry about being too close to walls, and if you practice with it, you can even consistently hit weak spots. It also deals shock damage and applies overloaded on hit for 10 seconds. Its ease of use makes it a worthwhile pick on almost any build. This was the build I used, Deathwish and Guard Dog from Ritualist and Handler respectively. For my trinkets, I ran Energy Diverter, Rerouting Cable, Ring of the Vein, Heart of the Wolf, and Burden of the Destroyer. For the Mutator, I decided to run Shielded Strike. This build is a more damage-focused variation of the build I used for Hero Sword. When it comes to mobbing, this weapon is really, really good. Landing back-to-back -back weak spot hits is so satisfying. Definitely do keep an eye on your stamina though, as it's pretty easy to get carried away and throw one too many axes and have no stamina left to do any sort of evasive maneuver. And although the description does mention the cost being 25 stamina to throw it, that is just the flat amount that it takes away from you when you do the throw action. The minimum stamina you actually need is only 10. This little oddity also applies to the Hunter Spear. This is my go-to melee for Apocalypse, so I would definitely say it's worth using on that difficulty. Next category is the Claws. The Claw moveset consists of close-range slash attacks similar to that of unarmed attacks. There are five different Claw variations, three of which are non-boss, two of which are. And just like the Swords, we did not need three different non-boss variations. Although, from a visual standpoint, they all look awesome. Vice Grips especially. It's a shame they only have 6% crit chance, though. <laughs> Rusted Claws and Decayed Claws both have 14 and 16% crit chance, respectively. Vice Grips could probably go up to 10% crit chance. Although, honestly, I would like a lot of these non-boss variations to just get some sort of mod thrown on them. That would be an honest solution for a lot of these, although that would be a lot more artwork and mechanical additions. It'd be nice, though. Moving on to the first of the two boss claws, we have Feral Judgment. Its mod, Death Sentence, charges up after dealing melee damage six times. Within ten seconds, of course. When charged, the neutral dodge attack applies a debuff of the same name. After 1.5 seconds of being marked, enemies will take ten additional melee attacks. These Phantom Strikes deal 25% more damage against enemies that are bleeding. They're also able to crit as well. Pretty much anything that affects melee damage will affect theirs as well. The build I went with for this weapon was a bleeding-focused one. Juggernaut, Miasma, Abrasive Whetstone, Burden of the Rebel, Blood-Tinged Ring, Ahane Crystal, and Timekeeper's Jewel. And once again, I used Vampire Blade. Out of the two boss claws, this one is my favorite. It's really, really cool seeing all ten of those little slashes go off at once, especially when they all crit. It deals some pretty good damage. When you have something like Juggernaut boosting your attack speed, getting those six initial hits off is really fast. I totally recommend giving this weapon a try if you haven't already. Last up is Nightshade. This repurposed claw from the Nightweaver isn't too complicated. Its mod, Beyond the Veil, turns your neutral dodge into a Misty Evade. This actually bypasses the slower neutral dodge caused by having Ultra Heavyweight. It also grants you a buff that gives you 5% of your base melee damage's lifesteal for 5 seconds. This duration is doubled if the neutral dodge was a perfect one. And that's really all there is to the weapon. It's just a pair of claws with a kind of cool neutral dodge and a bit of lifesteal built into it. It does have a very high crit chance of 18%, although it also has the lowest damage of the bunch. The build I decided on going with didn't really matter too too much. Pretty much anything that has a bunch of extra melee lifesteal will work pretty well on it. Although at this point you might as well just run any of the other claws if you're willing to stack this much lifesteal. I don't even think it needs any sort of real buff. You could maybe raise the lifesteal to be 8-10%, but I think it's honestly fine as it is. I'd still rather run it over either of the non-boss claws. Moving on, we have the staves. The staff moveset is pretty much just swinging around a really big stick. 
the strongest attack, and probably one of the best they've ever done for a melee weapon, is the charged neutral. There's only one non-boss staff, and that's actually a good thing. The way I see staves, they aren't really melee weapons, they're more so tools. Each one has their own unique benefit. Dreamcatcher and Red Dose Staff are both charge-up weapons, just like Gas Giant. In the case of Dreamcatcher, on charge attack, you generate a 20 meter wide aura. This expands out and then retracts back to the player. Enemies that are caught in the aura are afflicted with slow. You also get a stack of Reverie for each enemy afflicted. This gives you a 2% total damage bonus and 2% movement speed bonus per stack. I'm not sure if there is a cap, it doesn't mention one in the description, but getting 10 plus stacks of Reverie makes you move really fast and is a really nice damage boost. And it's a total damage boost, so it affects everything you do. This is kind of what I meant when I said staves are tools rather than melee weapons. You could keep using Dreamcatcher while the buff is active, but I personally don't think it's a great use of the effect. The staff moveset just doesn't do a whole lot of damage. 15 seconds of potentially 20% or more damage and movement speed, on top of the 10 seconds slow that enemies caught in the aura suffer, gives you plenty of time to just reposition or deal a bunch of damage. It's also worth noting that the weapon is actually affected by the resonance trait and sources of increased status duration. That last part isn't actually updated visually in the weapon's card, although if you have Affliction maxed out or Timekeeper's Jewel, you will notice a significant increase in slow duration. Red Dose Staff is more so of a weapon than that of Dreamcatcher, in that its mod, Lifeline, actually deals damage. Upon dealing 750 damage, when you do your next charge attack, you'll summon forth a small doe that'll pierce through enemies in a straight line. And while this does go through enemies, it doesn't go through terrain. So it's definitely possible to just whiff the deer and have it smack headfirst into a wall. One thing I do like about the weapon is its healing ability. Upon sending out the doe, yourself and any allies within the doe's path will be healed for 10% of their max HP. For summon builds, this is actually really nice. In fact, it was something I brought up back in my old Meatball Medic video. If you and your friends are just wailing on a boss, this is actually a really good way of just patching up chip damage. It's no resonating heart or burden of the divine, but it's still kind of nice. The Labyrinth Staff is something I slept on for a long, long time. Basic attacks with it generate 10% more mod power, but the charge attacks with its little AoE generates 50% more mod power. If you combine this with Arcane Strike and Spirit, and maybe one of the rings that also gives mod power, oh my god, this generates a shit ton of mod power. I could totally see people running this in an Archon Summoner setup. Any sort of build that needs a bunch of mod power really quickly, even something like Ring of Spears charges up so, so fast. While the weapon is actually really good, I do kind of wish it had a slightly larger area of effect for the charged attack. Maybe three, three and a half meters? It is affected by amplitude, so it already has that potentially boosting it. A little more would be kind of nice. All three boss staves are absolutely worth running on Apocalypse. Up next we have Katanas, two regular and one boss variation. While I do have a soft spot for Edge of the Forest, I wouldn't say you should run it or steal Katana. The Katana moveset has a bunch of quick slashes, the highlights of it being the sprinting attack which covers a lot of distance, and the charge neutral attack as always. Although on the Steel Katana and Edge of the Forest, it's different than that of Spectral Blade. In its case, the charged neutral attack creates an 8 meter wide hitbox. The size did used to be affected by the resonance trait, although it's not an aura, it's an AoE attack, so you think it would be amplitude, right? Well, in the last patch, it was changed to work with neither of them. I kinda wish they just reduced the base size of the effect and just let it scale with amplitude instead. But it is what it is. 8 meters of range is still really huge. Like a couple of the other melees we've talked about so far, it does have the cost of the attack, and the neutral dodge though, so you do have to conserve your stamina a little bit. Since the attack can cover such a large area, I decided to run a build that benefits from hitting a bunch of things at once. Juggernaut Attack Dog, Matriarch's Insignia, Brawler's Pride, Berserker's Crest, Xania's Malice, and Band of the Fanatic. One interaction that the weapon has with the mod Boar is that any target that has a Boar Drill on it will take an automatic weak spot hit from the Whirlwind. This can deal some insane damage. And in fights where there's a bunch of targets to hit constantly, Matriarch's Insignia will keep us topped off on stamina, pretty much spamming the attack as much as we want. For the Mutator, I chose Shocker, 
Shocker has an interesting synergy with Whirlwind. Every single hit landed with Whirlwind will give Shocker stacks. That means that pretty much every swing, if not every other swing, is gonna have the effect of Shocker Activate. And that causes a lot of chaos. If there was one reason to nerf the original size increase effect of Resonance, it was probably for a build like this. I have so many clips of just running into rooms, doing the attack once, and every single mob in the room dies. Throw in Bisected Ring, and yeah, you can imagine why this had to be nerfed. Despite the nerf, it's still an incredibly fun weapon. If I'm not running Krellax, I'm probably running this. The spears are in a similar predicament to the axes, in that there's two basic and one boss variation. The moveset consists of pokes and a few slashes. If I had to choose between the basic axes and spears, I would probably go with the spears. Their motion values are just a little higher than the axes, and they have the ability to be aimed up or down. This lets you aim for weak spots a little easier, which makes sense considering they have an increased weak spot damage stat. The Hunter Spear is a thrown weapon just like Krellax, although in this case it has a corrosive dot. Unlike the Krellax, however, it doesn't deal elemental damage. The swings and thrown projectile just deal basic damage. The action of throwing it is also a bit different than Krellax. There's a bit more commitment to throwing it. What I mean is that with the Krellax, the moment your character gets ready to throw it, releasing the button will result in the axe being thrown. With the Hunter Spear though, if you let go too early, that throw animation will turn into a stab. It is kind of annoying, I kinda wish it worked the same as the Krellax, especially since it's not considered a charged attack at that point, it's just a basic stab. I'm not sure how easy or hard that would be to implement, but if there was one last quality of life change the weapon could receive, this would be it. Since it's buff in the last patch, in my eye, it's starting to rival the Krellax in terms of fun factor. Here's the build I ran. Miasma, Attack Dog, Energized Neck Coil, Timekeeper's Jewel, Red Ring of Death, Shadow of Misery, and a Hanai Crystal. And the mutator I ran was Tainted Blade. Energized Neck Coil makes every single charge throw of this weapon deal 20% of the entire corrosive dot in a 5 meter radius instantly. Oh boy, for mobbing, this might be actually more fun than the Krellax. Unfortunately, it does take the dot from the base weapon and not the Tainted Blade application, but it's still really, really good. Hell, even in boss fights, it can deal a pretty good amount of damage per throw. It's also just a lot easier to throw than Krellax. It goes more in a straight line, whereas the axe has a small arc. I did a run on the train from the Rood, and I completely demolished it without any issue. I definitely do not sleep on this weapon. It's way better now. Second to last of the base game melee categories, we have the unarmed weapons. It's pretty much the bare hands and the knuckle dusters. The moveset is just some punches and an overhead slam, which oh my god, look at that motion value. That is the single highest motion value out of any melee weapon category. It's kind of a shame that the bare hands just have no reason to be used in this game. They don't scale unlike in the first one, leading knuckle dusters to be the main source of unarmed damage. Thankfully, they are really good still. If not a bit kinda ugly, I would have definitely preferred to have the option to make them invisible or something, but mods on PC can do that. The main difference between melee damage and unarmed damage is that there are two rings that specifically only benefit unarmed attacks, Charnished Ring and Meteorite Shard Ring. Those together boost your unarmed attacks by 80%, although Meteorite Shard does increase your encumbrance by 50. Unarmed attacks do still count as melee damage, so any source of melee damage bonuses will affect them as well. In the chance that you manage to land a weak spot hit with your neutral charge attack, it's gonna deal a lot of damage. The build I went with was Juggernaut, Wormhole, Butcher's Fetish, Meteorite Shard Ring, Tarnished Ring, Dull Steel Ring, and Haymaker's Ring. For the Mutator, I decided to go with Overdrive. It's definitely the strongest melee mutator. It's basically momentum, but for melee weapons. With Juggernaut up, the light attacks are insanely fast, and when you're dealing crits back to back, the damage adds up really, really quickly. Using Wormhole makes the neutral charge attack even more deadly. Since our weight was increased by 50, I figured we might as well go all out and have the full Leto set. 145 encumbrance gives us 29% more damage with Haymaker's Ring. If I didn't care about getting weak spot hits, I would probably go with the Gamblers instead. I also ran a Resonating Heart with Triage maxed out, 
just so I could have a constant source of healing the entire time. If you don't care for the neutral charge attack, which you probably should because it deals so much damage, you could swap out the dull steel ring for anything else. And that's the knuckle dusters. Maybe we'll get a boss variation down the line. Although at that point it might just make these obsolete. And last but not least, we have the flails, of which there are only two, and they're both basic weapons. I think the ornate flail is a little better, because it has 7% more crit chance than the steel flail, but it's up to you. The steel flail has 18 more base damage compared to the ornate flail. The flail moveset is just a bunch of twirling around the head of the flail. The charge attack for this class of weapon is probably the most complicated out of every category. There's essentially five parts to it. The second stage is the most interesting one, that being the hold in place attack. This does drain your stamina as you swing, but it can hit continuously in a small ring around you. It's a neat little crowd control attack, and it's the one I'm gonna make my build around. I call this the spin to win build. Elixir of Life, Juggernaut, Decayed Margin, Bisected Ring, Elite Chamber, Hardcore Metal Band, and Dreadfont. And the mutator that's gonna make this all work is Steadfast. Since the spin attack counts as a charge attack, we will essentially have full stagger immunity during the attack. Infinite poise, if you will. It also makes us take 20% less damage and converts all damage we take during said attack into Grey Health. Throw on some Life Leech, Grey Health regen, and you have a build that can pretty much face tank a lot of the game. I know that Red Prince doesn't deal a ton of damage compared to other Apocalypse bosses, but this is still a pretty funny sight. Just like the spears, you can actually aim the attack up or down to hit weak spots a little bit easier. This build definitely doesn't work on all bosses, some just deal way too much damage for this to be effective. I did end up equipping the entire Leto set just to get a bit more damage reduction. Also, sometimes hitting weak spots consistently can be a bit of an issue. I'm not sure how to describe it, it's a little weird. If you use the weapon, you probably know what I'm talking about. You can be standing still sometimes, not moving, and the attack will just not hit a weak spot when it otherwise would have. I think the attack sometimes just passes through hitboxes as well. I noticed it happening a couple times in the testing range, although that might just be some weirdness with the target dummy hitbox. Even still, I would consider the weapon class definitely worth using on Apocalypse. If I were to change anything about the weapon class, it would probably be making the charge attack itself considered similar to that of the Krell Axe or Hunter Spear. And what I mean is that sources like Aim Down Sight's movement speed could affect your movement speed while charging it. It's a nice comfort stat on those two weapons I just mentioned, and in the case of the Flails, I think it would be a really nice stat to benefit from. And there we have it, every single melee weapon covered. I was not planning for the video to be this long. As I started recording footage, I realized I had a lot to say about the melee weapons. I think there's a lot that can be done to improve the state of melee in Remnant 2. I think the Lust Patch was definitely a great start. I would definitely consider a lot of the melee mutators worth looking at if they were to consider rebalancing melees at all. Like Overdrive just stomps on everything. Now I'm not saying to just nerf Overdrive. I think bringing up a lot of the other ones is the better route to go here. And for the non-boss weapons, Maybe just up the stats a little bit, make the critical hit chance a bit more consistent, and maybe do something about the itemization of stats like Stagger. It's so small and inconsequential for most of them. Like minus 3% or plus 4%, they're way too small to make any sort of difference most of the time. Personally, I would like to see at most just one non-boss variation for every weapon class type. But I know that would be a decent bit of work for the art team, localization team, programming team. That's why I think a simple stat tweak for a lot of them would be sufficient. I want to give a big shout out to the Remnant 2 wiki, not the Fextra Life one, for all of the motion values in this video, as well as some other tidbits of information I did not know about going into this video. Their wiki is really clean and sleek. I'd definitely give them a try, they're way better than Fextra. That's all I got to say. Sorry that it took so long to come out, and that it's this long. I promise that no video for the foreseeable future will be this long. Although the next patch is seeming to be very, very big. So who knows. I know I didn't cover the basic scythe, which is considered base game now. I figured I would cover it with the ritualist scythe, which is in the DLC. And that one is probably coming up next. 
there's only like six or seven weapons in the DLC, so that video will be way, way shorter compared to this thing, and thus will be out way sooner. Thank you for sticking through this monstrosity of a video. I really appreciate it. I will see you all in the next one.